Now, I absolutely love the looks of the Kawasaki Z900 RS SE, and I love its four-cylinder engine, so much so that I bought one, this one, last year. But have I made a mistake? Hey, guys, it's Mr. Fla here, hope you're well. And uh, you join me today back out in the environs of Great Missenden on this uh, a little bit dull spring day in sort of pensive, thoughtful mood because uh, I'm out on the uh, Z900 RS SE, the big Kawasaki and I'm kind of considering whether this is a keeper after a year of ownership is this a bike that is going to be long term in the Mr. Flyer stable so let's go for a bit of a ride as usual I'll tell you my sort of thought processes on it and see if I can come to some sort of conclusion Really, I'm after your help and your thoughts and comments below on this one. But uh, anyway, let me take you through my thought processes, as I say, and then you'll see the dilemma I've got, which is very much a first world dilemma. I appreciate that. So I'm uh, very lucky being a sort of a full time YouTuber and motorcycle enthusiast. I have a number of bikes. You've not seen the channel before i've got this my kawasaki i've got a uh, custom royal enfield interceptor i've got a shrimp speed twin and then for longer trips i've got my bmw r 1200 gs and i've got a gold wing and my missus has also got a little 125 in the garage so six bikes in the garage a great problem to have and of course depending on how the mood takes you depends on which bike you ride and uh, what, off, what often happens is the bike that I want to ride is actually, well it's always flipping at the bike I want to ride is the one that's at the back of the garage. So it's a big old effort to move bikes around. No big deal, but there is that. It's especially when you're talking gold wings and things. And I've also got, uh, I haven't got a very big driveway. And I've got three cars on that driveway, so invariably I have to move cars and five bikes to get the bike out that I want. So that's, that's the first issue. So I'm thinking, do I need all these vehicles? Do I need to maybe trim down a little bit because uh, it's just a hassle moving stuff around when you want to get a bike out to ride so that's that's the first thing in my mind thinking why maybe I should trim the fleet down a little bit the next thing is uh, cost of course when you've got well six bikes there and three cars nine vehicles to maintain it's very expensive not only is it expensive in terms of insurance tax MOT servicing but also just the tight time it takes to actually manage those vehicles you know to check to make sure that what's coming up obviously i put reminders in my calendar and stuff but it is and again this sounds like me just you know rich man whinging i'm not uh, i'm really not whinging i'm just i know i'm very fortunate but uh yeah it takes time to manage those vehicles as well when you're doing everything yourself so there's that and i'm thinking well if i got rid of a car and maybe a bike or two it would make my life a bit easier and the other thing is actually finding time to ride and drive these vehicles again I know this is a this is not isn't a problem at all is it but I'm just giving the reality of owning several vehicles I am very busy day to day it takes me a lot of time and effort to make YouTube videos again this is I can hear you sobbing and playing the violins in the background but it is a time-consuming thing to do and therefore I don't get a lot of time just to go out and uh, ride my bikes for fun or indeed indulge in my other hobbies, which I do have. The reason why the channel's called the Missenden Flyer is because I'm a pilot and that's another hobby of mine. I like to go and fly light aircraft. Again, I can hear the violins going. Park all that for now. I mean, I'm sure I'll get all those nasty comments in the, uh, in the comments below, but I'll just ignore those. So fill your boots, put those in there, but don't think you're having any effect. But anyway, that is the situation I'm in. So the next question then is, well, if you're going to thin down the fleet, which bikes are going to go? Oh, look at that helicopter up there. Robinson R44, I believe. It's pretty close to me, although it looked far away on the cameras. I think he's doing a bit of flight training. I think he did an auto rotate over there, which is basically when you try and do an engine off landing in a helicopter. Providing nothing's fallen off your helicopter, it's quite easy to glide them to a landing, apparently. I'm not a helicopter pilot, so I don't know, but anyway, I suspect that's what he's doing. Not a bad day for a bit of that. Anyway, where were we? Yes, my bikes and which one to get rid of. So, let's sort of go through them, starting from the top. So I've got that uh, 
the big Goldwing, brand new, well it was brand new in 2022, I've not ridden it much yet, I absolutely love that bike and I've got to do some more mileage on it soon. I've got formulating a big European tour to do either this year or next on it with Mrs. Flyer on the back and I really do love that bike. There's an opportunity to get past this white van here, look. See down there. So yeah, I've only done probably, I don't know, two and a half thousand miles on that bike and that is of course a big mile munching bike. Made for touring two up. It is the perfect bike for that. I've not come across a better bike for two up touring. So I'm not minded to get rid of that one anytime soon because I do love that big six cylinder engine. It's and it's just so good for touring and I want to do get more effort out, more use out of that bike. Yeah, I just haven't used it enough yet. So so let's strike off the gold wing as one to get rid of. Next up, BMW GS. A bike that I absolutely love. I've got the 1200, it's quite old now, it's 10 years old. It doesn't owe me anything. I've done loads of miles on it, so I'm getting on 30,000 miles now. But the thing is, that bike pretty much launched my YouTube channel. It's a bike that lots of people got to know me on. I've been all sorts of places on it. I drove the thing up to the Arctic Circle, for goodness sake. Done all sorts of tours on it in the past. I love the bike. I've got a relationship with it. I'd be really, really sad to see that bike go. And anyway, it's not worth that much money now anyway. I don't know, second hand it might be worth eight or nine thousand pounds, I guess. I don't know, I haven't checked what the values are recently, but I guess it's in that order. It's not really depreciating much anymore. It doesn't cost me much to own. And it is still a great bike. It's a great all-rounder. It's a great winter bike. It's still a great two-up bike, actually. So you could argue, why do I need that and the Goldwing? Well, I don't need both of them, of course. But for me, if I wasn't YouTubing, maybe it would be a simpler, you know, simpler thing. I think, well, get rid of the GS because you've got that Goldwing. And the white van to dispatch when I get a moment. Clear everywhere, yep. Thank you. Thank you, sir. All over for me, what a nice man. So yeah, I don't need two touring bikes, but it does have a lot of sentimental value for me, that bike. So the GS stays for those reasons. All right, let's leave Mrs. Flyers 125 out of it, because that's sort of a separate thing, really. She's learning to ride at the moment, and uh, I'll give you some updates on that in due course. So then on to my other bike. So I've got the Triumph Speed Twin, which I absolutely love. It's a bike that's grown on me over the years. There's nothing about that bike I don't like. It's nice and light to wheel around the garage. It looks great. It sounds fantastic. It's got a lovely burble to it. It's got amazing torque off the line. It's really quick. And when you're just cruising along on it with that thumpy old nature, it's just lazily lollops along with that big 1200cc engine. I really love it. And again, even though I've had that for some time, it's a 2019 bike, I've just got luggage fitted to it. I want to do a bit of touring on that bike. So that bike, to me, isn't one on the radar to sell. Again, I want to do more with it. It's comfortable. It looks beautiful. It goes well. It's just a great bike, it's got bads of character as well. As, as retros go, I think it's top notch. So the Speed Twin stays. Well that brings me on to my Royal Enfield. Now that's a custom bike, so again I spent you know, a lot of time and effort and money indeed, famously money on that bike. I bought that bike to customise, so I'm not too worried about the fact that I ended up spending probably bike included about 13 grand on it. To me, it's worth that. That's a 2019 bike as well. Now, I never intended to tour or anything like that on that bike. That is very much just a Sunday afternoon, summer riding around the lanes type bike, of which I do plenty on that. And I really enjoy riding it. Whenever I put a picture on my Instagram of that bike, people say, what a lovely bike it is. And that is true. And because it's kind of made to my specifications, what on earth would I want to get rid of it? So that's that. I don't want to get rid of it. So that's why that bike kind of stays. And then, that leaves me with the last but not least, this, the Kawasaki Z900 RS, which I only bought last year because I've always lusted after the RS. And I bought the SE model with the fancy Olin suspension and uprated Brembo brakes. I also love this yellow ball paint scheme, which only the SE version came in. It cost me quite a lot of money. I think it was about 13.8 I paid for it. And then I've put a few mods on it, things like radiator guard, I had the heated grips fitted, the different uh, logo on the tank, the retro one. 
I've also recently had some bags fitted from SW Motec for this. An opportunity to overtake here, yes there is. So I've done a few bits and pieces to the bike subtly that, you know, I appreciate. But again, I haven't really had the chance to properly ride this bike yet. And having got those bags fitted, and having only just bought the bike, this being the newest in my fleet at 2022, I've no intention of selling this yet either. Watch another white van up. Third of the day and I've only been on the bike 20 minutes. Incredible. Hopefully I'll get a chance to overtake him as well. So those are the reasons. Oh, he's turning off. Excellent. So those are the reasons. I don't particularly want to get rid of the Z900 RS either. So you see my dilemma. So given all that, what makes me think the Kawasaki may be the one to go? Well, despite all those good things about the bike, um, there are a few downsides. Now, I've written these down to take you through uh, the things that I've learned about this over the time that I've had it that maybe I wasn't expecting, that I don't like so much. So first thing is that actually it's quite heavy to move around. It's a big old bike, this, and actually shifting it around my driveway is quite difficult. No big deal, but somebody like me, I'm not a particularly big bloke, I'm five foot eight, bit of a wimp, and I've got dodgy shoulders. Just let this car go past. I choose the busiest road to do these things on. Another couple of cars, stand by. Right, quiet for a moment. Good, excellent. Uh, so yes, so with my dodgy shoulders as well, I just find it a bit hard to lug around compared to some of my other bikes. So that's one thing in my mind. Next thing here, um, it's, it's smooth all right. That big four cylinder engine, part of the reason why I bought it, absolutely lovely. But the result of it being super smooth is it has absolutely no character whatsoever. Now I didn't think I was a big fan of character in bikes, but it has to be said, when I compare this against my Triumph, and my Royal Enfield, they just make you feel better when you're riding them. Now that four cylinder engine does have amazing performance. In fact, this is probably the quickest of all the bikes that I currently own. Uh, of course, it's based on the Z900, which is a sort of a street fighter type bike, if you like. So it is very fast. And the trouble is it encourages me to ride everywhere a bit like a lunatic. One of the reasons why I got rid of my sports bike is because I just felt I was riding everywhere too fast. And this bike, despite its looks, does, have, does make me do a bit of that. So that's another reason in the back of my mind I'm thinking actually, do I need to be riding everywhere quite so fast? Another thing I've been slightly disappointed about with the Kawasaki is some of the build quality, in particular, these clocks, which I do, let's just get a better angle, these clocks here, which I do love the looks of. They look amazing, much better than the TFT, but they are a little bit plasticky. Look, you can move them around a bit. And uh, if I come around here, if I give them a little knock, I don't know, they just feel a bit, a bit trumpery compared to the similar clocks that I have on the uh, on the Triumph, for example, which I think are also probably plastic, but they just feel more solid, more solidly built. So, yeah, there's some little bits of build quality on it that I was a little bit disappointed with. And then last but not least, this bike has no British connection. It's a little bit, and you know, when it comes to retro bikes, I love there being a British angle. Now, I know my, neither my Royal Enfield or probably my Speed Twin were built in Britain, but they do at least have some claim on some British heritage. Both bikes were at least designed in the UK and uh, Royal Enfield used to be a British manufacturer and Triumph is still British owned, albeit the bikes aren't made in the UK. So there's that too. So welcome back aboard the Kawasaki and uh, I have to say I don't have any of those reasons to dislike the Speed Twin and the Royal Enfield. No, sir. Now don't get me wrong, I still love the Kawasaki for all the reasons that I bought it. The looks of the bike, the smooth four-cylinder engine is just completely different to the way that my other bikes feel. The fact that it has got a little bit more go. All those reasons still stand as to why I bought the Kawasaki in the first place. Yet in my mind I'm still thinking when I look at my sort of fleet overall, the retro bikes are the obvious place to have a bit of a cull. I just haven't, uh, for the reasons I stated earlier, I haven't had enough use out of this bike yet and uh, I just don't want to get rid of the Triumph or the Royal Enfield. So there's my dilemma. I want to get rid of some vehicles, but I'm really struggling to know which one. I think in all likelihood, it will be the Kawasaki that goes, because I can't think of many instances when I want to go out on a retro bike and the Triumph or the Royal Enfield wouldn't be enough, you know? So I suspect this is the bike that's going to go first out of them all. Ooh, slow down camera here. But I definitely haven't ridden the bike enough yet. So I think what I'm probably going to do is just put up with my first world problems. 
for probably another year or so get some more use out of this bike maybe do some touring on it properly get it out of my system before maybe in a year's time thinking about putting it out for sale I just got to hope then if I do put it out for sale and if I do get rid of the Kawasaki I don't start thinking oh I've got a gap in the garage I could fill it there's a couple of Ducatis I very much like the look of I'll let you guess which ones they are <laughs> and they could easily fill that space so uh, I know what I'm like what a dilemma I'm on the horns of anyway be really interested to hear your views on all that in the comments below do let me know your thoughts on my dilemma whether you think my analysis is flawed and which vehicles I should be getting rid of maybe I should just get rid of a car instead that's just as painful a thought though anyway hope you enjoy that little video I'll stick a little fashion segment after the uh, credits to this and uh, if you've not come across that before I often get asked about the kit I'm wearing the jacket I've got on and so on so uh, what I'll do after the end credits I'll do a little one of my fashion segments I'll take you through all the kit that I've got on and uh, so if you're interested in that stick around till the very end of the video for that bit but otherwise that's it for this video I hope you enjoyed it just a silly little vlog really but uh, as I say interested to hear your thoughts on the dilemma I'm currently riding all right look forward to speaking to you next time until then this has been Mr. and Flyer Cheerio Right, thank you for sticking around until the bitter end and the fashion segment. So first off, let's go through, uh, well, I'm going to go through all the kit that I've been wearing on this uh, video, just so you don't have to ask me those questions in the comments all the time. First off, helmet you saw, this is my Shubath C5. This is called, uh, this is in the master yellow scheme. It's a brilliant helmet. It's ECE 22.06 approved, which is the thing that you currently need them approved to. It is a flip front helmet, as you can see. But what I love about it is when it's not flipped, it just looks like a normal sports helmet. It's also brilliant as a vlogger because it's got this little chin thing in here, which means I can wedge my uh, microphone under there with a bit of Velcro, which is brilliant. It's got uh, all sorts of features and functions on it as well, including things like, although I wear sunglasses with it as well, a drop down sun visor. And uh, yeah, it's nice and light. It's, uh, it's basically a really lovely helmet. I've been wearing this now, or one of these for probably two years. I've got a white one as well. And these come in at around about I think just under 500 pounds, something like that. Anyway, I'll put a link below to the Shuba C5 if you're interested in that. Next up, my neck buff. There we go. That's my TMF neck buff, obviously. You can get these from my website. That's, they're about eight pounds. That's www.themissendonflyer.com. Again, I'll put a link to that below. Next today, you saw my bearing boogie gloves. These are Gore-Tex, so they're properly waterproof and they've got uh, goat skin palms as well. I just find these really good in winter. Uh, they're, as I say, waterproof because they're Gore-Tex, of course. Brilliant and only 95 quid. I'll put a link to those below. This lovely brown jacket that you've seen me wearing is from Bering, as it says on the front. It's actually their elite jacket. It's like an urban type jacket, so it's uh, CEA rated. Uh, and it comes in at around about 260 quid. I just find it nice and light, sort of in the middle of summer and winter. This is a springtime video, believe it or not. It's sort of, I don't know, about 14, 15 degrees, something like that out here, centigrade. And it's just ideal for these sort of things. It comes with a liner, but I've zipped it out because instead I've got this on underneath. I'll show you that. Right, this here is my Rucker Lati mid-layer. Uh, it's a brilliant jacket. I just use it around uh, about the jacket as well as, uh, sorry, around about the garage and the house and what have you, as well as using it as a mid-layer underneath the jacket. It's nice and stretchy. It's got these quilted front and back. Comes in, I think, around about 100 quid. Again, I'll put a link to this below. Underneath the Rucker mi uh, mid-layer, I've got a Rucker base layer. This is part of a two-part set. Comes in quite a reasonable price, I think they're about 45 quid. There's a uh, ladies set available as well. It's got that clever um, sweat wicking materials so that means you stay uh, both warm in winter and cool in summer. Uh, I've got a few sets of these again, link below to that. Next up, my uh, riding jeans. These are from PMJ. You've seen these many, many times on, on my uh, channel. These are my favorite uh, single layer jeans. They are AAA rated, so they're as protective as you can get, come with all the right armor. They're from an Italian company, say, called PMJ, and they're, the brand of the, or the type of these is De. D-E-U-X, I'll put a link to those below as well. And then last but not least for the fashion segment, these are my uh, Falco Gordon 2 boots. These are just brilliant. What I like about them is the fact you've got this uh, sort of Velcro bit and a zip here, so they're easy to take on and off. You don't have to worry about all the laces all the time. And I think they just look great, particularly on a retro bike. I use these day to day as my normal shoes, as well as on a bike. So uh, yeah, I recommend those 100%. 
All right, so there we are, that's the uh, fashion segment. And just a quick word about those links, all those uh, links I've put below are what are called affiliate links and they're to a company called Sports Bike Shop. Now, if you do click on those and subsequently buy something, uh, that means I get a little bit of a kickback, so it'll be helping the channel out, but at no extra cost to you. If, however, you don't want to buy online and you want to go and check these out at a local dealer, but you don't know where your dealer may be, then check the link below for bikeheads.co.uk, channel sponsor. If you go to their website, you can find out where your local dealer for all this kit that I'm wearing is.